much, Deb. And I second Deb's thanks to you all for being here tonight. I know um, we have uh, few people, but quality people. So if anybody wants to move further up, because we tend to be a, um, a well-mannered and soft-spoken lot, so if you have any trouble hearing, or if you prefer to maintain a safe distance, that's fine too. Um, we're very happy that you're here, especially because it's often said, and I think quite rightly, that perhaps the most important task that a school board has is hiring a superintendent for the district, hiring a good superintendent for the district, hiring the best possible superintendent for the district. It can make a tremendous amount of difference for, um, for our schools, for our students, and for our townspeople as well. So um, every now and then, uh, someone will say to me, hey, didn't we elect you guys precisely to make these decisions? Why are you asking me for my advice? And um, I, have, I have two big reasons for this, a whole bunch of small reasons, but um, because the superintendent is such an important figure in our district, the only person working for the district that the school board supervises directly, um, the only person we're able to fire if things don't work out well. Um, we need to make sure that we have someone who is in tune with our people. Um, even though we all have varied opinions, varied priorities, and many different ways of looking at things, I think it's fair to say that we also share um, something one might call a common culture or a common set of values, um, similar ways of, of viewing the world and responding to situations and events that makes it important for us to have as the head of our district, as the leader of our district, um, the chief executive of our district, someone who is in accord with this, with this culture and with our values, who will generally decide in line with the way we believe she or he ought to decide. So being able to consult with, um, with you is an important part of getting a feel for what we need in that superintendent. And a second reason, which um, is perhaps more personal to me, uh, I think being able to consult with our people is a great luxury that we as a school board have, as a local governmental body. Um, consult in a way that's natural, we know each other, uh, we don't have to sit in hearing rooms with that intimidating um, paraphernalia of, uh, of legislative majesty. Um, you're just here, and we're among friends, we're among neighbors, sometimes even family. Uh, and this, I think, allows us to forge that sense of solidarity, which we absolutely need. And um, I think we'll perhaps need even more as, um, you know, as we're subjected to, to tests along the way and to crises in um, society and economy. Anyway, um, this is not about my philosophical vision of the superintendent. This is about what you want in a superintendent. So with that, um, Mark Andrews, our esteemed facilitator, will, um, will take it away. Great. Thanks, Scott. Welcome, everybody. Um, I have a very minor role tonight. Uh, we've changed the format. We're just trying to judge what best format to use to engage you in, the, in answering a number of questions for the board, for the steering committee of the search committee. 
Um, but because of a smaller number, we've 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 changed we've changed direction a little bit. Um, the more important work is going to come from you for the next 45 minutes prior to the budget meeting happening at 6:30, I believe. So our time is short. Um, we have in front of you five questions that the steering committee, uh, who's charged with um, um, coming up with a process to engage their respective, the respective stakeholder groups in our five communities, including employees and community members, um, and then to, to generate um, a, a, the first round of, of interview questions for that first round of candidates that are selected. So your input into um, this process is, is tantamount to our ability to come up with a, a list of questions that, and to vet candidates that make sense to uh, or align with what you believe is important. So your input tonight, based on these five questions, will be used, number one, to help inform our, our interview process, um, and number two, to help vet um, candidates um, as we go down the road um, in the next few weeks. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Floor, um, who will be your recorder. Um, and what we're looking for is not quality, um, what we're looking for. What we're looking for is just to generate um, your idea, you know, as many ideas as you have or priorities that you have based on these five questions. So it's not about debating what has what has more relevance today. It's really what you're thinking, and, and then we'll bake this into the overall list of um, uh, priorities that others have have weighed in on over the last last week or so. Yeah, and we thought that you know, if the best use of the time, have as much of a conversation as you want. But if you have something that you agree with somebody else and don't necessarily want to talk about it, you can just say, you know, can you add a dot to that comment, and then we can move on depending on. And you'll be our timekeeper, yes, so. right? Mm -hmm. So, do you want to start? Ready to go. <laughs> so we'll probably have, if we, if we do the, the math, probably you know six, seven minutes per question, um, and then we'll have a wrap up and do some summary. Mm -hmm. okay. So what do you think the role of the superintendent is or should be? We're not talking about the, you know, by law, but what do you think? Educational leadership. Vision. Encourage academic excellence. about equity, because I was going to say something similar about equity. Do we mean like things are, if there's equity amongst the schools, meaning I'm going to get this, as good an education at Berlin as I would at Romney, that kind of thing? Is that what we mean by equity? I, I believe so. If that's because that's, that's what we say yes, yes and. Yeah. So between the schools and within the schools. Right, I knew within the schools, sure. Okay. skills for this I would say a competent delegator of responsibility. Um, budgeting. 
management skills. <laughs> well, management, th those are the people skills I meant for the management yeah. aspect. I think budget is a separate right. uh, bullet. I would say budget slash financial management skills. Back to roles, accountability, offer a fair and equal and excellent education. Can you start again, or just sorry, accountability? So, to provide yeah. accountability for the school district to the community. For the accountability of the school district to the community. So, um, four. 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 Two. No, two. Accountability to the community. The, this, this superintendent needs to make sure that the schools are providing what they're supposed to to the community. speaking before you write it down, but our math scores and our reading scores are low. Mm -hmm. And I would like the superintendent to be using research-based materials to improve our scores. So that's research-based. And to keep an eye on that and make sure that they're going up over time at all levels. Research-based, um, could it be on best practices to improve our schools or research-based? that work? I don't want to word it for you, I'm just trying to... No, I haven't thought a lot to about it. You can go to the next one and I'll come okay. up with what I want. Faculty development and support? Yeah. 
me just can I add, for the piece on the research, ma'am, um, one of the things that's come up is, is being current in the research. So whether, whatever discipline, math, or reading or science, be just knowledgeable, knowing how to, how to research, but knowing how to take that information and apply it to the same. Just being current in your knowledge base might be helpful. Um, yes. Or we can add to it. Well, it's interesting. Some of these, like the role versus then what are their personal attributes, for yes. example. The line is a little bit right? yeah. yeah. crossover. All right, we can move to the next one. Okay. Thanks. Does it matter the order? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Is it up too high? It, no, it's okay. It, what do you believe is the direction? Oops. Can we go there right now? Yeah. What do you believe is the direction the superintendent must lead the Washington Central Unified Union School District in? Besides changing the name? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think I would um, build on the promote equity and um, as a fellow short person. I um, so building on promote equity makes something about um, a holder of uh, equity as a non-negotiable goal. Um, Can you read that again? Direction of the what direction the superintendent must lead in. So beside not, I don't, it's these are related, yeah. but that is the. Yeah. Can I ask, can yeah. I ask a tricky question? Yeah. What? Because we are having trouble ourselves defining what is equity. So in your, because I want this to be from you. So, but in from um, you what? Not for everybody, for you. Sorry. Well, there's the question of right, for quality of opportunity versus equality of outcome for different forms of equity, for example. And I think we're trying to suss out. The, um, that the, the meeting uh, kids where they're at um, and not in the same way. I couldn't hear what you said, Al. I was just thinking, well, you should define it. I said meeting kids where they're at, yeah. as opposed, and, and understanding that what they need is different based on the different starting points rather than treating all kids that are, as if they're in the same, starting in the same place. But, and, um, so student base, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I think yeah. that in terms of building on that one into this question, what the direction is that um, it is a building a common understanding across the district, across schools, for all staff, all faculty, all people in the building, so that people actually do have that common understanding. Cool. That like how you're putting this under direction, because not everybody may come equipped with that but they can lead it. Well, they have come on understanding of equity, come on understanding of student needs. Yeah, of, of that the, I guess, the importance of equity as the, in, as the direction that the, um, the district needs to move in. Can I add to your definition? Yes. The, equal, uh, ensuring equal access to all education. So all kids can access their education. Yeah. And protecting them. And, and ensuring and protecting them. Access. And the other end, this is maybe where Cindy was going, high achievement and opportunity for students, for all students.
there's kind of an interesting footnote to that one <laughs> in that um, we've often talked about uh, whole child education. Um, and so, you know, achievement as measured by the state of Vermont can be somewhat a different target than achievement as measured by the people in the community to include, say, like arts education that does not have as obvious uh, an academic target. Uh, for liberal arts. Mm -hmm. Whole child, holistic, yeah. some, something along those lines. Yeah. Whole child education, whole child center. I think it's enough of a yeah. recognizable buzzword. So uh, uh, the comprehensive um, evaluation of the different schools to determine where there are inequities um, so that they can be identified and addressed. Um, because when you use the word equity a lot, sometimes you just think it's a, just to have the substantive, this is what isn't being done. And where, is it, where there, there are um, differences among the schools. So comprehensive evaluation and that the okay. comprehensive evaluation and then, and then they decisions. To address it. What? Would, could we add they get during decisions on what that information that they would request or just comprehensive evaluation of equity across the schools? Would that be a comprehensive evaluation of where inequities lie? Uh, and then a, a comprehensive plan to address them on a sustained in a sustained way. surprising outcome of this meeting <laughs> that we have to actually say, let's move in the direction of lawfulness. <laughs> it is a little discouraging, isn't it? Yeah. But there it is. Yeah, it's already on there. Yeah, just, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, on a different end of things, um, I think we should promote the direction of connecting students uh, with their place and civic engagement. Mm. We've done that in only a spotty way. Can you elaborate a tiny bit on that? Like, what are examples of what's already been done? Well, some schools have had farm, that stronger farm to school than others. Mm -hmm. Some have had more service learning than others. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if, if uh, it's all good. <laughs> I'm going to defer to uh, board representatives on the steering committee. Is this stick? Where's Stephen? Is this stick? Yeah. I've been away too long. Um, well, I'm posted. Well, I'm wondering this question is a hard question to answer, yeah. right? Is it short term? Is it mid term? Is it long term? Is there anything? the audience that sort of like pops for like, this needs to happen now. And in terms of leading the district, where are you today or in the school year 2020, 
2021, what needs in your mind, what's the priority for a start, you know, because some of these are, they're all awesome, but some are sort of long term, right, and some need to start tomorrow. What are, is it appropriate to ask that question? Sure. Mm -hmm. I think so. so, and actually, with regard to thinking about that, if I may, one of them, I would say, so I'm the parent of uh, elementary school students, first graders, so I haven't been in the school system for a long time, and so I'm coming from a perspective on the school system that had struggled with a particular issue of openness. And I don't know how much that has impacted other schools and what they might be looking for. Um, and so I don't know how it applies on the U32 level, but, um, and there are certainly these issues about why a school system can only be so open with regard to student information as to protect and so on, but it feels like compared to the previous administration, there could be a little bit more transparency with what goes on with the school, a little bit more openness in the communication process, and so I'd like to see that. Okay. As to what, though? I mean, um, it, it, I mean just because, well, one is a for context. Right, right. Well, some of that is just uh, more regular communication as well. So um, for me, so that's, that's sort of like an immediate thing that needs to happen, right? So I wonder if we want to highlight floor. Um, you know, with a dot or something. Mm -hmm. We had dots. We want to use our dots. We want to use our dots. Um, <laughs> but that might be a short-term thing, and we really need to pay attention. The board needs to pay attention to now. Mm -hmm. right. here. Well, I, I, I put a dot on that, but I don't know. That's the rest of the community. Your dot is your dot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are others who use some of these things just pop a few more than others in terms of needing to happen, like now or next year. RTI, response to intervention. <laughs> Sometimes they call it a multi-tiered system of support. We, we yes. have, yeah, yeah. And so yeah, we're we're working team, on we can continue that. to work on sure. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. The, the, the law thing would seem to be significant again. I'll come back to that. <laughs> And we can, if, if you need time to think about this before you leave tonight or before we transition to the next meeting, you can okay. dot yourself. Um, that would be appropriate rather than taking time at this moment to do that. I just have one, one more topic, which is uh, parent and community involvement. Um, yeah. Well, I think you can say welcome parent and community involvement. That's a great Welcome, welcome as invite, encourage, welcome. Yeah, it feels pretty close. It would be nice if it felt open. Yes. All right, well, we're going to move on to the next one before we move on. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm. What are the most important personal attributes the superintendent must possess? Sense of humor. <laughs> like interacting with kids. I mean, I don't want them to stay in the office. Accessible to kids, yeah. Professional expertise. Oops. Philomath. is a lover of learning. Yes. Because, yeah, I think that's as important as be wanting to instruct. Somebody yeah. that's excited about the actual yeah. process of learning themselves is able to that's push that energy. Lifelong learner, lifelong learner works for me. Yeah. 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 Otherwise, you can write philomath in Greek. Yeah. Yeah. So you just have to spell it for me. Like P-H-I-L-O, like Mount Philo. Oh, philomath. Right, <laughs> and then math like the... M-A-P-A? Yeah. It's an I in it, but that's not that important. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Laura, did you mean to put a dot by the last one on the last uh, your orange target there? Okay, so the parent uh, involvement. With oh, yeah. community organizations to provide more support, more support to communities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Let's say a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say this one either, but um, belief in research. <laughs> In science. Can I say beliefs or belief? You want either. I would like the person to believe in research and science. Yeah. How about the, the belief in the potential of every child? side of that too. They, that boundaries that are not a little too close to the chest. Right? Right. Yeah. 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 I was going to say transparent integrity. So that fits in there somewhere. So you know when the boundaries are being broken or saying. Transparency and integrity. Transparent integrity. integrity. Uh, a people person, which doesn't mean they have to be an extrovert, but they have to like working with people. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so along with that, I was thinking about approachable as a teacher. I felt like all of our superintendents so far have been very approachable in the last 15 years. And so I'm hoping that um, continues with the next one. Emotional security. Um, I don't know if this fits there, but somebody who wants to be the host, not the hero. Be the, the host of the convener or yeah. the, the not the hero yeah. you know, yeah. coming in and so, having all the answers themselves. So it's not a polymath? <laughs> Knowing that they're surrounded by a polymath. Sorry, I was saying a host, not, not a hero. So yeah. they yeah. under, yeah. They, yeah, I totally know what you're yeah. <clears throat> It's not about him or her. But this is totally self-confident. Self-confident and humble? Is that well, humble? combining those so that the quality is inter humbly self-confident. Oh. So, so it's the, the combination of the two. Mistakes. Mm -hmm. Are we ripping these up and throwing them up the chimney looking for Mary Poppins? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We're doing a pretty credible job of building yeah. a unicorn here. Yeah. Um, supportive, both of staff and students.
interested in this. Oh, sorry. Where, where is that photo from staff? Both of staff and students. Interested in difference and diversity. I was trying to think of the opposite of xenophobic. <laughs> And personal, you said? In the diversity and the diversity. Right? Yep. And a couple more. Can we say feminist or some other more politically correct? Mm -hmm. I, I, You don't like eyes, do you? That's a... I, you, can, you can correct us, right? We know what it is. Translate. We don't appreciate diversity here, so better, better, better tone that down. I'm not, I'm not number, I understand that. But I think I'm I'll walk you down. <laughs> Okay. okay, any dots or are you guys okay, just do that. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. I can finish the research based one now. I think um, research based effective mapping. Uh, maybe you just want to say literacy. Research based effective. Research based effective. We, yeah, so they're going to effective um, math and literacy instruction. <clears throat> and then you can put a parentheses stem. Oh, that's a direction. Is it? So. <laughs> okay. What are the most important skills and experiences a superintendent must have? They have to be an effective communicator. Writing and speaking, listening, or just okay. Mm -hmm. um, experience with trauma informed and trauma responsive organizations or institutions. Coaching on the athletic field or all of that? Probably <laughs> coaching subordinates okay. and, and teachers and Okay, teachers. just to, clear, just to clarify. The coaching experience on the athletic field is valuable too, but yeah. just wanted to make sure. Yeah, no, that's not what it's on. Part of staff development. Yeah, professional development. Just going to say some details. Lifelong learner. Can can we just say something like C direction, like C number? <laughs> right. You know, thing educational leadership experience related to the things that we've put as the direction of our of our community. And, and I guess um, an experience is seeing excellence in those areas. Let's maybe be more specific than what I said before. So they don't need to have done it 
all, but they need to see what it looks like when it's good. Recognizing. And it can link to, I think what we heard is just re reference, there's some things on number one that might re align with that floor. I had experience with newly merged districts. <laughs> Or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah, I, I can't decide. <laughs> Having worked in a war zone. Yeah. Um, the uh, one thing that I'm not, I don't think is strictly necessary, but it sure would help is actual teaching experience. <coughs> it is a requirement of licensure in the state of Vermont. It is. To have three years of teaching, okay. three years of three years of administrative experience. It's redundant to write it down. Well, no, no, I think that's an assumption we should check. Okay. As an educator or in teaching? It, it, it's fairly vague. It's teaching. Yeah. yeah. If Lori doesn't say it, I will. Experience as a superintendent. There. Scott, so you mean not interested in teaching somebody to be a superintendent? Not this time. Well, that's, I, I'm, I'm reflecting a view. I'm not saying that that's absolutely what we're going to do. Um, we're, this is open. But that would, be the, that would be the correct inference to draw from that. Experience of winter. <laughs> well, that just I mean, yeah, winter. That's, that's an excellent point. <laughs> right. Can't ask that question on the air. Miami superintendent moves up here and says, like, oh, heck with this, I'm out. <laughs> Have you driven in snow, they said. <laughs> what type of car do you drive? Yeah. I mean, I think another way to frame that, I mean, I'm just having fun with that question is, um, understanding rural education I and mean, understanding, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, what, what small schools are about, yeah, small, what small communities are about. I just understand that that's small a, a, sort of a, a good question to be considering or a good yeah, criteria to be thinking about. Yeah. Small and rural. Yeah. Small and rural both. Yeah. I think they need to have fiscal competency. Mm -hmm. They handle an awful lot of money. A minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> Until it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. What level of engagement should be committed to both in your area of work? Okay, let me see. Okay. What level of engagement should be committed to both in your area of work and the broader professional community? What it might look like? Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of yeah, our, where are that question? Could be that. Oh, is that I skipped? What level engagement should the superintendent be committed to? What was uh, um. in? Rather, at the professional or at the community level. So what level of engagement should the superintendent be committed to both in your area of work and the broader professional community? What might it look like? What do you mean by your area of work? Right. Who's you? And the broader professional community. Well, if you, so if you think about the different stakeholders that are represented in tonight's meeting, community members, parents, non-parents, employees, students, if there were any. Um, so big picture of where you see engagement as being the most effective and then based on what you do, like your, your role tonight, what would you like to see in, 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 in terms of their engagement with your discipline or in your in the group that you represent tonight? Is this where we ask if we need a superintendent? No. <laughs> where, where do we ask that question? Wait, is that a choice? That, that's, that's, not nice, that's, choice. that's not the nice meaning. <laughs> so, so for, for, for teachers who we've met with, a common, a common one is, 
come into my class and be visible, right? I mean, be know what's going on with learning, know what I what I'm challenged by, know what I'm celebrating, that that type of thing. Yeah. So you, it's kind of like interest group. You're saying what if you have a particular interest in superintendent, what do you want that? Yeah, I mean, we heard someone tonight say, I don't want someone to stay in their office the whole time. Right. So what does that mean? Right. It's not just being visible, it's about engagement. What does engagement look like? So as a community member and parent of somebody in the school system, it goes back to something I've mentioned probably on every sheet so far, is the communication aspect and seeing more, like, I am aware of what's going on in the school because I come to all the meetings. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I know my wife, for example, is not has no idea what's going on in U32 because there hasn't been that broader community engagement. And I think that broader community engagement is important, not just for the parents of students that are in the system, but for the rest of the people in the community to understand why they're paying the tax bill that they're paying. And so I'd like to see a relatively high level of engagement with the community as a whole. And maybe not just face-to-face, -face, but it's communication. It's it like that monthly on vehicles to do that. Right, right. Thanks, that was good. And you brought up in the Romney meeting having a newsletter. Right. You were saying something? No, no. no. Didn't need some I mean, there's another way to look at it, if I may. And when you look at engagement, there's different forms. It could be informing just one way, it's informing you. It could be consulting, like we're doing tonight, asking you to give us your ideas. There's also a level called um, involvement. We want to involve them, but, but ultimately the decision still rests with another body. And then there's true collaboration in terms of engagement, in terms of identifying what we want to work on together, or we make the decision together. So there's different ways to think about engagement. It's not just one way. It could be depending on what the situation is, right? Right, and like I'll mention, for example, that in the previous administration, we started doing the school start time investigation. I was involved in it, and I have no idea what happened to it. <laughs> like, is it dead? Is it just on pause? Or it's on pause. And so, and I, it was understandably contentious. And on the one hand, kudos to the administration for starting and involving the community in this big discussion. But then, like, it just where does so, the decision? So the follow-up communication didn't happen. Right. Right. If you're still using dots, I put a dot by that one. Then follow up communication. I'm not sure if this one really belongs there, but um, and if there's because we have like five minutes left, yeah. if there's something that you want to add in any other question, or there's some last. You know, comments. Don't feel like we have to concentrate on. Well, so, so you guys can all decide where to put it. But um, supportive or um, motivated to help increase economic opportunity for our our kids. So that means educationally, you know, being successful and seeking whatever it is they want after graduation. And it's also being engaged in saying, oh, here's um, career opportunity, you know, the potential for career opportunities locally. We need to make sure our education is doing its um, so job. So putting the frame, the frame of engagement, making sure we're connect, connected with the business community or what the economic, what, what are the opportunities for students to, so they'll, once they graduate from, from high school, is that what you mean? There needs to be a partnership with with that, that group? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's so much the superintendent, but I think it, it's a direction for our district that we want, not that we're always just focused on career, but that we want to make sure we're, we're both meeting the opportunities that are around us mm -hmm. on all levels of education, but for the kids coming out. And then also if there are opportunities and we're not, it, it's a, it's a two-way thing, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an engagement yeah. question. I don't know where it belongs. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's right. And <laughs> engagement with economic actors in our in our region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe both short term and long term. So if there are kids who already know that they're not going to go on to post secondary, what's there for them? And it, it involves some affiliation with the tech center as well. Yeah. The word that hasn't come up here is uh, vocational. 
instruction. And so somebody that is... Very right. innocent at rear. <laughs> it's not a rear sense, not a sense. Yeah. Yeah. You can always tell when the name changes like that so rapidly that there is sort of a, a funny, not a stigma necessarily, but a, um, a quality attached that is constantly being, the effort is constantly ongoing to avoid that. To rebrand it? To rebrand it. Soon brought to you by Northfield Savings Bank Center. <laughs> no, I think there, is, there are a lot of opportunities for us to engage more with the Career Center and have more of a cross communication. So, you know, maybe have some of our computer sciences at the Career because they're all to, should be a little more integrated. To, yeah. You know, like you can't fix a car with that that type of stuff. So, just, yeah, just a agree. quick question: Are they? They're not part of the district, though. I mean, you don't have to go into all the details, but like, where did they get? We, we pay for okay. our students to, to go there based on the students that, and I, Stephen can speak more accurately, based on the students that we had the year before is just how the funding works. So it's within the Spelman budget, but we are one of the sending schools. Okay. Yeah. So Montpelier, Harwood. Okay. Yeah, there's, yeah. In Vermont, they're regional. They're regional, okay. yes. So we belong to the Career Center in uh, Spelman. So I wanted to provide Scott a couple of minutes for wrap up. I know it's it's close to six thirty. Um, we also would be very well would welcome receiving more of your ideas um, after tonight's meeting. This was we only had forty five minutes, but um, we can you can send them to to any one of us, like I suppose, on the steering committee. Uh, in addition to what you've already put it on tonight, um, we can add the list. Um, yes, yeah. great. Okay, I guess that's my cue. Uh, although, though, may I add one more to this? Sure. Uh, engagement with surrounding districts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Outside of this union, Scott? Yeah, yeah. you both outside of this. Well, before fully passing you the baton, I want to. Just give great thanks to Floor. A round of applause. I don't think you were expecting that role tonight. I'm so, I so much, so much I'm very appreciated. Put in, so it's okay. yeah. You're going to rotate. So, thanks so much. Um, and now I will continue the theme of thanking people. Um, now we know that what we're looking for is Superman or Superwoman. I think we're in. Um, we're on much firmer ground. <laughs> um, so, Very yeah, we'll, we'll tear it all up and throw it in the chimney. Um, kind of let the Pope <laughs> white smoke. Yeah, I don't so, think he um, can meet these qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> all right, there's so much heckling from the other. It's a good sign. You're at the viewer, right? right? Number one on the list is what we want. <laughs> So Mark, what are we going to do with all of this? How will we... We're going to, we're going to roll it up and we're going to uh, we're going to break it into some themes and we're going to add it to um, the list of what we, what we have generated so far. Great. And do we, um, do we have email addresses from attendees on there? We don't. We could. Yeah. yeah. Would you be interested in getting a kind of compendium of all of this so that you can hold us to these criteria? as we um, proceed in the process? Or I don't care. Does it matter? You want to put the bag? You want to put the bag? I don't know. I don't know what the bag is. There are also things available online. Yeah, we can make it, let's make it available online. We'll use technology. Uh, and maybe note that it's come out uh, in front porch forum in all the towns. That's a great idea. Yeah, thanks. We need to look for it. Yeah. Yes. Especially compared to the ones that uh, Stephen and Adrian Megida and I would have in the years past when the three of us would be the only ones who would be here. Um, in any event, this is our FY 2021 board budget presentation. What we're going to do, I think, is just hit the, um, hit the slides and at any point where anyone has a question, please feel free to interrupt 
um, and, and pose your question. Um, if there's anything that's unclear, please don't hesitate to, uh, you know, to flag it and to ask for an explanation. If I don't know, Flora is likely to know. And if Flora doesn't know, then Deborah is likely to know. And if Deborah doesn't know, then Lori for sure knows. <laughs> so we're covered. Um, Okay. Scott. <laughs> 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 Can I start with a question at the get-go? Yeah. I flipped it open and I see merged to single district on July 1st, but I thought that was still in court. Um, yeah. How uh, did we turn into a merged district? I, and where did the name come from? By operation of law, the name, um, I guess, came from the Agency of Education. So, it's um, redundant. One more Does reason to hate them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. I'll just start that little heckle yeah. right at the get-go. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. I'm, um, that's what makes it interesting. Um, and just on the court case, evidently, the oral arguments are going to be held on January 15. I don't know if you're aware. Um, in Middlebury, is my understanding. In Middlebury? In, in Middlebury. Middlebury. In Middlebury. It said a um, student center. Do you remember the name in of the In the middle of the day. It's, it's a in student center at the uh, uh, in Middlebury College, can't see the name of it. Right. It, it'll, you can it's look it up online at 1, we'll 1 30 for an hour. Wait, did you say for an hour? For an hour. Each side gets half an hour. Usually it's uh, half an hour. What? Usually it's 15 minutes aside. Right. They schedule this, they doubled the time. They doubled it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, just, to, just to kind of orient you, uh, these are our board goals, and I don't think anybody is going to see anything surprising or controversial in them. Essentially, our goal is to do a good job as a board, and that just spells out three ways in which we uh, intend to do so. Um, board members, there are 10 of us right now. The board, according to our articles of agreement, is scheduled to expand to 15 members, three from each town, all members elected by all voters in all five towns at once. So um, at the moment, I should just mention that we have, um, in addition to Flora Diaz Smith here, uh, we also have Jael Postkamp from Worcester and Chris McVeigh from Middlesex. Lindy Johnson from East Montpelier, and Jonas Uno Van Fleet from Worcester as well. So um, I guess board members make up a significant percentage <laughs> of the audience, which is good. I'm happy to hear it. Others, um, the, the board has, the reason why others aren't here is that um, this board has had a killer schedule throughout the fall. Um, policy committee, Negotiations Committee, Finance Committee, and just our regular meetings uh, have, have um, I think, uh, tested our stamina. Um, and it's important to stay rested and, and not burnt out to the extent possible. But not to worry, they're, they're fully um, plugged in to what's going on here. So, um, competing pressures. I think, uh, as I survey the room, uh, all of you have, um, have had some degree of experience with school budgets. So none of this will be surprising that it's a, um, it's a tug of war, a push me, pull you kind of dynamic process to arrive where we are. And, um, and there are always sacrifices, there are always compromises, and there are always sort of um, some of the best parts may be left on the cutting room floor. Uh, and I suspect that this budget is no exception. So, any questions so far? All right. And um, this, is, this is the uh, flow chart. Um, uh, rinse and repeat as we go through. Um, but essentially, the way it works is that the budget arises 
from the administration. Then it comes to us in the board, and we sort of give our reaction to the administration, which takes the budget back, and then there's this cyclical um, rotation of, of documents until uh, everybody feels as though we've gotten it pretty much right, um, or at least as close as we can. Um, this part here is very important because the budget is still in a kind of um, malleable stage where we can, we can shape it before it, it, it hardens into something more nearly approaching stone. Um, so that if, if you look, and, and this is where um, I, I think it will really be helpful to us for you to be paying attention. When we get to the budget scenarios, we want to hear from you what you think may be maybe good, maybe not good, maybe wondering why isn't something else there. Um, so that's exactly why we're doing this, is to hear all of that. Can um, I add something to that? Please. It's, it's, it's student-driven. So, because sometimes it kind of sounds confusing when we say, you know, superintendent, administrators, and staff get together, but it's the center and student needs. Right. So, the the staff are and the administration are basically uh, accounting for what they see, the needs that they see, the opportunities that they see, and factoring that into their budget. So, um, thank you. Um, enrollment trends. Uh, this is over the past five years, and you can see there's a there's a, a slight dip, but otherwise pretty stable. Next year, um, for FY21, is there uh, is is it inflected slightly upward or is it continuing slightly downward? We haven't received our equalized pupil count for FY21, which is actually going to be determined. Uh, so according to statute by the 15th of December. Uh, so we will hopefully have that information for the board at the meeting on Wednesday. Uh, but as you can see, current enrollment, which is students who are enrolled in all of our schools, has been extremely steady yes. over the last five years. Yes. Um, equalized pupils, however, after peaking in FY18, have been declining since. And the, what makes this difficult is that the tax formula has education spending divided by equalized pupils. And, um, and then there are a bunch of other denominators below that. But if that fraction, if the equalized pupils are going down, then the value of the fraction, which is what our tax rate is based on, that is going up. Even if we weren't spending any more money in education spending, we would still be spending more in taxes because of that decline in equalized pupils. So enrollment, preserving enrollment to the extent we can is really, um, is financially, uh, has a great financial effect. So, highlights. Um, as Deborah was just saying, stable enrollment. Um, excellent administration, faculty, staff, and why didn't you mention school board? <laughs> no, you're, because you're speaking, and I assume people will understand. <laughs> Understood. Huge day. day. <laughs> and there's no budget line item for you. Mm -hmm. there, we actually have a, our own little budget line item. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, dynamic student body, most definitely. Um, educational opportunities and merger are, um, again, other factors that are um, very influential in this budget. So, um, draft number one. And again, uh, if, uh, I'm going to be looking carefully to see if I see eyes glazing. Um, so far, it seems OK? Yeah? OK. Um, this is the level of service, so-called level of service budget. Um, Cruise control, autopilot, we just do the same thing next year that we've been doing this year. Uh, however, 
taking account of cost increases from this year to next year. Um, and you can see that in this, the bottom line increase in education spending is 2.77%. What would have been the increase, the natural sort of drift upwards, is closer to 5%. Those two, uh, if you look at the budget change percent column, and then the two lines right below, um, it would have been 4.96%. 4, 4 uh, however, because U32 is paying off one of its bonds, the bigger, uh, the bigger bond, uh, that amount of debt service will no longer have to be accounted for, or will no longer have to be paid in next year's budget. So that um, subtracts 1.36%. Uh, what date is the bond uh, satisfied? Do you know? We have, at U32, we have two bonds. Um, one is 29, um, this fiscal year, and the other is two years out. On, I mean, on July 1st? Um, right, so for the next budget cycle, July 1, there's um, one of the, lo the $9 million loan will be paid off. Yeah, on, on July 1st, 20, 2020. 20. Mm -hmm. okay. So. I'm sorry, <coughs> which is the second bond? It was 3.1 million. Yeah. And that'll be paid off within two years. Okay. Two more budgets. Thanks. Right. So this is the big bump downward. And it's a one-time bump. So um, in next year's budget, we it won't show minus 460,000 because we'll be operating from a lower base. Um, so, 2.77%, um, but that's without doing anything different from what we're doing now. And we, we can do things different, we just don't have different people doing it, right? I, we could, you're right, right, Chris. We could, within that, that ceiling, right. we could um, reshuffle um, to some extent. Uh, would there be a lot of latitude from that? Uh, we could uh, do things differently by changing the focus of how we utilize our professional development resources. Uh, if we have some staff leading by attrition, we could examine the programs that they represent and determine if we want to continue those programs or make a change. Um, student needs change over time, so even within a level funded budget, six months or a year from now, we may see other opportunities because of changing student needs, which might free up more resources uh, in the special education area, for example. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's many uh, many opportunities to make change within this budget. Right, but not unlimited. No, so, uh, and I know we're getting to draft 1A, but I think that it's important to point out uh, that the board's charge to the administration was to examine our individual schools and ensure equity across each of the schools in the area of opportunities and instructional supports in particular. Uh, so once we had completed this draft, the leadership team took time to analyze uh, how we were committing our resources in those areas in particular, and they became a focus of uh, the second draft that you're going to be reviewing. And we believe the second draft provides, uh, addresses the question of equity that the board had been uh, desirous of looking at this year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so um, any questions on this? It's just numbers on a chart. But it, it, will, it will have more meaning once you get to see the second draft and get to compare it. Um, next, please. So this is, um, this is one of those pie charts that shows how the money is actually spent. Ordinarily, I, I look at this and I, I just think, pie, oh, when, I, when am I going to get to eat? But, um, but in this particular case, it occurred to me that uh, it's worth mentioning, because so much of this budget is paid in salaries and benefits um, to actual people who live here. Um, this, is, this is an aspect of the school as a kind of economic engine for our communities that is, um, is important to, to bear in mind, that 
schools, even though people are paying taxes and it feels like it's just you know, shelling out, um, it's shelling out to create something far greater than what we might otherwise have. There's a multiplier effect in here as we support our, um, you know, people who are our neighbors, who are fellow taxpayers, who buy from us or sell to us, and who participate in creating um, you know, what's best about living here. So this, I think, um, yes, yes. I just get, well, along those lines, one of the things that might be interesting to break out at some point, I don't expect an answer on it now, but is the benefit component of these salary and benefits. In particular, how much health care kind of changes from year to year is really impacting that number. Yeah, um, there's, you'll see some of that on the detail um, with the yellow lines. Yeah, um, good point. OK, um, now, if you remember the, the uh, level service budget, the cruise control budget, was the bottom line increase, budget change percent, of 2.77. This graph shows a bottom line increase closer to 5%. Um, the bond payoff is the same. What's different is the salary and benefits and non-salary items. Um, and the natural increase, you know, subtracting, forgetting about the bond repayment, that's a 7.2 increase over our last, or over this year's um, salary and benefits and non-salary items. Um, and we can um, continue. So this pie chart, I defy you to tell me what's different about this pie chart from the last <laughs> pie chart. <laughs> Salary went down and special ed went up by 1%. There, there are always two. Um, yeah, exactly. So the, um, basically, the, um, what's happening is that special ed is, um, is increasing non-salary. Well, the whole pie is bigger. But the share of special ed is somewhat bigger relative to non-salary. And I, I don't know if you have any. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I assume that um, in draft 1A, salary and benefits goes from a 3.97% to a 6.11 because you're talking about, in order to reach equity, hiring more staff in some of the schools where there's a need. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's correct. So, and. and just to, to kind of put some flesh on those bones that you were just talking about, the hiring of new staff. Um, this is the, um, the list of budget considerations um, recommended by the leadership team. So um, I think what I, I might make an observation and I would invite any sort of um, corrections or amplifications or modifications to that observation. Um, it strikes me that when you look at this, uh, and thank you for spelling out E E E, that was great. Um, it's essentially foundational. Um, we're shoring up the foundation for what our schools do. Um, the basic idea, the basic problem, let me start putting it that way. The basic problem is that we're receiving in our schools more and more young people who are, in some ways, um, injured by the um, the public health and, and social crisis that's unfolding at this point. So um, we're finding, and Kelly again, I, I will stand corrected, but that the, um, the number of, of children coming into our schools with 
showing uh, evidence of emotional trauma, psychological trauma, is increasing, I, I could only say dramatically. Um, and what happens is that these, these children have to be taken care of, not only on the basis of pure humanity, but also on the basis that um, our classrooms become unmanageable if you don't, if we don't take care of them. So there's both a moral imperative and a practical imperative for, for doing what we must and what we can to, to provide the support that these, uh, especially you know, these children need, so that everybody else will be able to learn in an optimal way. Um, in large measure, uh, so my observation is that in large measure, this is a response to conditions in society, in our communities, not only in our communities, but throughout Vermont, throughout the country, that, um, that are essentially forcing our hand. And um, particularly as uh, higher levels of government tend to uh, step back, perhaps, from involvement in uh, social supports it falls increasingly to us to essentially backfill that void. So I don't know, I, I've, um, that, that's kind of part by way of explanation, part there's an editorial component to it perhaps, but I would invite um, anyone to, um, because uh, I mean, I would love for example, to see, to see something new, to see foreign language programs, um, to see an expansion of the music program, um, the strings program, uh, or band, uh, to see other sorts of um, what feel more like advancements as opposed to kind of um, rear guard actions. But I think you know, the leadership team has put a great deal of thought and, um, and effort and heart into sorting through the possibilities, and this is what, um, this is what they're recommending. Or has it come? Please. Can I add a comment? I, so, you know, it's not all special education, or like, these are best practices, and, uh, and also it's, uh, in, say, the student, um, is a student is a student driven. So, for example, the interventions that, that you see here is, is from our belief that all students can learn, right? So that's sort of what brings, in our mind, equity. So the instructional the instructional interventions that we have that work with students, it means that a student gets a shot in the arm on math or on literacy for six weeks, and that means that he's not falling or she into special ed. So it means that all students are getting what they need. But if, that's, if there's a group of students that can be working while these students are working on literacy intervention, can be working on music or making a ukulele, or do, you know that that also is able to happen. We, you know, that's the, you know. So I, I don't want it to feel like you know I agree with totally where Scott put it. You know, the adverse childhood experiences that we are experiencing in our society are real. But 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 the budget takes care of. Of, of everybody, it has high expectations for all, right? It's not a special hey, Scott, when we, when we had the discussion at the board meeting, um, I recall that the first three items are not really recommendations they required. Well, it, I, I believe that, yeah, that what that's I, is that what I understood? true. Given the new, uh, the influx of students, the previous, the budget number one, version number one, the level of service, uh, was just what we were doing this year. But next year, we'll actually have further needs that, that, are, um, that we're required to meet under the law. Um, and, and those first three items, yeah, are in that, um, in that category, correct. Thank you. Okay. Just, just for the requirement is different than recommendation in terms of a budgeting. Yes. 
So, so we have to do that. Exactly, we have to do that regardless. Yeah, yeah. Right. regardless. Michael. Um, Scott, what's the difference, um, or what makes up the difference in the revenues um, in draft one uh, compared to draft 1A? I can so follow. Yeah, it's reimbursements for those top two items on the list that we just added. Um, if you look at the sheet that we have yellowed, do you have the summary sheet? Here? So, so, so that negative is about three, four, six, five, eight, three is is a, is a more revenue. Right. We had sixty-six thousand okay. and forty-three dollars in revenue right. generated from the first two items on right. this list. Okay. So, yeah, I was just confused by the yeah. minus sign. So, but, but that's more revenue to right. offset. So it reduces taxes. I'm trying from, to keep this on the straight. Yeah. It comes from the state. Um. Right. Are these uh, positions mostly at the elementary level or high school, or is it a total mix? These positions are transitioning to U32. Some are coming from the elementary, but it is sixth graders coming in to seventh grade. And then there's additional staffing associated with that. Because um, there's an increase in student Students population from six and seven? Mm -hmm. okay. What's the um, community <coughs> connections line item? Oh, yeah. yeah. How um, is that different? <clears throat> yeah. Do you want to do that? Okay. Uh, so community connections is a wonderful uh, before and after school program and actually provides a complement to our school preschool part time preschool program. Uh, beginning. Yeah. Okay. Beginning in the um, fall of this year, the Community Connections Program became completely operated for the schools in Washington Central. Prior to that, for I think 18 plus years, it had been a combination of, or a partnership of Washington Central Schools and Montpelier School <coughs> District. Uh, last year, the Montpelier District chose another uh, route, mm -hmm. and we decided to continue the program um, but when, uh, which resulted in about 50% of our students' participation uh, being reduced. So this year we uh, committed to continuing the program and as the school year unfolds, we're observing that there may be some need for the district to subsidize that program. It is actually a district program. It's always been a district operated program. Uh, and we understand that our families really rely on it and we would like to do whatever we can to ensure that it can be continued. Mm -hmm. So as we are in this transition year, we are estimating that there will be some subsidy required to continue the program. About what percent of our families are involved in that? And does it vary from town to town or can you not reveal? Um, Are we too merged to reveal which towns are the most advantaged? Do you want me to speak sure. to the, um, So yeah. we offer a, not a, a part day um, preschool program, and every student that stays here has the opportunity to go for the full day instead of getting to go to another daycare. So about 70% of our preschool students are participating in the, I call it a wraparound program. Meaning they can come early. True. They, yeah, it's yeah. like a continuation for daycare, so to speak. And that's true in every school. So every school has a, at least one part-time preschool class. Some have more than one, and it, it really aligns closely with their enrollment. Uh, and our enrollment in preschool is pr actually the largest increase that we see, uh, which is a great sign because it means eventually our elementary student numbers will grow as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just also say that the numbers are slightly confused by the fact that uh, students are not required to go to their own town's community connections. At least our kids, um, when they were in pre-K, we had two days at Rumney and they did two days in Berlin. So they did that for a year. Yeah, that's a oh, more rare right now. Hey, but, yeah. but there's another component, and that is that we um, also have students attend high-quality uh, early childhood experiences that are offered by centers off-site okay. and we have a responsibility to pay for our resident students to do that mm -hmm. as well so there's two ways that preschoolers can um, access education now yes so is this subsidy a way of not like in, if you said it's because now Montpelier isn't a part of it so we lost 50% of the enrollment 
Um, honestly, the way that that was calculated, I helped do that with our new director. Yeah. And um, what has happened is Community Connections has been living off a reserve fund over the years. Yeah. And that reserve fund is getting depleted and expected to possibly be gone next year. So this is the amount that we would have utilized from their carryover funds from the past. So this we is made, this is so you don't have to increase rates for parents and families. Right. And for the draft two budget, we're looking at increasing rates and reducing this number. Okay. So we just didn't have enough time um, yeah. within the last two weeks to get that number precise. But we're working on it for okay. next Wednesday. Okay. So so go ahead. <laughs> when you say draft two, you don't mean this. No, this is draft, this is draft one, one A. Yeah, this is draft. Draft two is next week. Draft two, yeah. Draft two is a pared down version of this um, with a target, a bottom line target, instead of uh, 4.8, whatever, 4.83, um, will be 3.5. So there is, I mean. More refined number. Well, we hope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, Thank you for checking. Yeah, and however, you know, that's, I'm, I'm happy to hear that that may be one effect of trying to lower the, um, the bottom line Maybe the raising of the rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because I right. thought that it was also a state-run program. Do they not get? Can they not get state assistance or state grants? Some families qualify for a, a daycare subsidy. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is income-based. And we do offer that. We support families and apply for that subsidy when it's possible. That's another revenue stream in addition to fees paid. By, but by being that they accept that, that's not some kind of. Uh, Anything they can use to get a grant because they have. <coughs> we have received twenty first century grants over the years, and okay. basically the way that things have turned out, we're no longer eligible. Okay. It's a federal grant. Okay. And that's how, in the past, we were able to build up some reserves. Yeah. Um, by okay. having that as an offset. We've also scaled our staffing down. Our director is now no longer full time, uh, which has helped some of the costs as well. Okay. And what is the work-based learning coordinator? What does that mean? Uh, so uh, we, that is an addition to an existing position. We have a part-time position at 60% here at the high school. And that individual uh, organizes or identifies mentors and organizes uh, extended learning opportunities for students, which is actually a requirement um, as well as a good practice, it's also a requirement of Act 77 in the district. So we are finding that we have more students that need that support, and uh, we have an excellent person in place who's certified by the state to do that work, and we'd like to expand to meet the need and the demand. Oh, right. mm -hmm. Is that the branching out program? Branching out, yes. Part. part. In part. Okay. Yeah, CBL branching out, pilot, um, all of those programs. Benefit from it. Okay, those are, these are all wonderful questions, and I'm kind of curious. You've seen what's here. Is there anything that you think should be there that's not? <laughs> Michael? Well, um, I proposed, uh, Anne and I have proposed um, uh, elementary strings theater program, as it is, uh, Doty is the only <coughs> school that uh, string instruments are offered at, and uh, this program feeds directly into the long-standing uh, instrumental strings program here at U32. Um, so students who don't go to Doty um, have to pay to take lessons have to and that is that's a matter of equity mm -hmm. and it's hurting the program here uh, by not sending many students into the program um, so basically every school should be as good as Doty mm -hmm. well <laughs> well we'd like to have a uh, traveling strings a teacher go around from school to school, a point three position, uh, uh, a point six position, three day a week position, um, to uh, do uh, lessons and uh, ensemble classes at all the schools so that every child has a chance to participate in this program and not just those who can 
afford private lessons. Thank you. Katie? Yeah, I just want to say I, I also think that that would be amazing, and I understand there are limitations that we have in our communities, and I know that we're all pretty, we're maxed out in our budget, and we need so many things, but I do think there's a real gap there. And um, my son and daughter both study strings, and they're lucky because I found a teacher, I signed them up, I pay for that, I drive them. It's a huge amount of time, it's money for our family, and I know so many people would never be able to do that. And my son is at U32 now, and um, his middle school strings group has been, I think there were seven students last year total in the whole middle school, and I think there are eight this year in the middle school who play string instruments. And the high school strings group, you know, with four years is a little bit bigger, but it's still a small group. Um, and you know, those kids just by chance and by their family's initiative are the ones who ended up playing those instruments. But think, I just think there are so many more kids who, if they had the chance, could be enjoying this incredible opportunity that's really like something else for your brain to do, something else that expands your world, another group of friends and peers and amazing teachers and a program you could be involved in. Um, so I just think that would be amazing. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dilemma. Um, on one hand, we have these, we have these areas of excellence that, um, I mean, in, in the case of the track, for instance, we have, we have a, um, a sports program that I think is not just an excellent sports program, it's an excellent life program, an excellent academic program, um, an excellent sort of social program for, um, for essentially shaping good people. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes the best programs proceed indirectly to their, you know, to the goal that we want to get to um, and support, you know, the rest of the academics. But, um, thanks. It, it, any others who, who see something that they believe should be there that's not there? Well, this is um, this this is just a, a short list of the new things. Yeah, this is a well. There, there's a there's sort of a longer uh, brainstorming list. Okay. Um, but and the reason I ask is because I, I don't have in, in my mind quite everything that's already in the budget. You know, what's already in the programs throughout the system. Um, but my you know one one thing that I think needs more attention everywhere is maybe I don't know if it's the work-based learning coordinator type of work, but you know alternative pathways to to um, careers. Mm -hmm. You know, not not just four-year college. Yeah, um, it's uh, Cindy Gardner Morris, who's sitting right behind you, mentioned this. You mentioned this in the superintendent search forum, if I'm not mistaken. Did you not? Am I hallucinating? No, you're not hallucinating. Like, I was making a note and I wasn't really listening. Oh, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> alternative pathways. That's transparency that we have. <laughs> alternative pathways to careers and other activities that, um, you know, uh, I guess you and Erica seem to be playing off each other, um, if I'm remembering. Maybe I am hallucinating. <laughs> I will just, when I asked about branching out, my son, who is now turned 26, was involved in that. He had an opportunity to work with some engineer, I think, at National Life, and we dropped him off there, but he somehow got a ride with the teacher was coming by in the mornings and made it to school. Um, he also had a chance to take Java in a programming class. And when he got to UVM uh, and was given a chance for a job, because he had Java for one semester, he was offered a job at $15 an hour, whereas his sister, who had, did not have Java and was working with biology, was offered a job at $8 an hour mm -hmm. as a, you know, basically unqualified kid, qualified with basic skills at UVM. So those kind of opportunities within the community, I mean, John saw how engineers work and what, the, what it's like to get up early and go to a job, and there are just so many benefits with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. that's why we're expanding. Wonderful. 
So um, there's still uh, Jonas. What else to say? Elementary foreign language instruction. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Near and dear to both our hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I realize your question was about any other line items that should be included in that. Yeah. One of the things that came to mind, I skipped ahead just to see if it was there, and I realize there's not an easy answer to this particular question, but it is a little hard to contextualize to most citizens what would it mean for another $760,000. Um, and so when presenting this information, it'd be really useful to say, you know, per $100,000 of house value, this is how much you would expect taxes. Yeah, um, and I know that's yeah, that's Wednesday night. It's, it's, yeah. it's different by town <laughs> and so on, but I, so I know it doesn't have a simple answer. But seven hundred sixty thousand that a lot. What, what does that mean? It's, it's a little yeah. too early. Yeah. We don't have all of the information we need from the state to calculate the taxes. Right, right, but you can we will next week, come up though. with approximations. Next so. week, we'll have it on Wednesday right. next week. So yeah. we'll come you have to wait for chapter week. three. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So that's a good question. I had another question about the fiddle program. Like, what percent of the kids in Worcester take advantage of the fiddle program, and who who provides the little quarter size fiddles? Like, do the parents have to come up with rental money for right. the fiddle? So um, we've had, Anna and I have actually reached out to uh, to string instrument dealers in the area, and we've uh, gotten a written commitment that they would loan instruments free of charge. They would have an instrument bank. And there are also several grants available to uh, provide uh, instruments free of charge to children in need. Uh, so as it is, I'm at Doty as a teacher there uh, for a day and a half a week. And during that day and a half, I teach uh, general music to every class twice. And I have, I have uh, right now, uh, 12 string students, and it's more people are taking on all the time. At the district music day uh, we had here, the stage was filled with kids. I, I don't know how many, like a hundred kids or something up there. Kids playing band instruments from all the five elementary schools. Uh, strings, uh, there were about, there were 13 kids, and they were all from Worcester. Interesting. Yeah. And so if you have a dozen fiddle students right now, how many students are at Worcester at Doty? Um, well, I, we offer uh, instrumental lessons to just the kids in uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Uh, okay. How many kids are in the school? Is that what, 70 so something? 80, 70, 80, 80, yeah. 80 kids. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Um, there's still a few slides to go, and you know, um, no slide left behind. So. <laughs> If you're ready. So I, I have one other quick question. Yeah. Is there a homework support um, club or after school way that if you don't know how to do your math or reading, you can get help with it? Uh, informally, teachers do stay after school. Uh, and our after school programs um, occasionally will provide support for kiddos. Uh, I'm not sure if the high school has a formal after school program for homework help. So, so definitely the ninth grade teams provide uh, four days a week because one day a week is the, their staff meeting, but four days a week there's after school help for the ninth grade teams. The tenth grade teams have scheduled time as well. Um, and all of our teachers have office hours of some kind that they And that's different from callback? And callback is a during the day time. Those office hours would be outside of the school day Thanks. time that's part of their contract. And, um, and then I would say our, some of our middle school kids who do our after the bell program receive. I would say minimal support, but some support in, in their homework. Thank you. Yeah. And I think there used to be through community connections. Am I wrong on that? There used to be. Used to but that was back when we had all the federal grants and requirements okay. associated with those. Okay. Yeah. See, we're doing more and more on our own. Right. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Deborah. So, more pies. Um, the, I think the, the crucial thing to get from these, which you can look at when you have. Um, leisure time of your own, is that the <clears throat> what's growing from FY, from this year to next year is the relative proportion of funding going to direct instruction as well as to uh, special education, and the lesser funding to uh, support programs, administration, and um, others. 
So it's a, it's a reinforcement of instruction. Um, if we may continue. This is, a, again, you can check this out. Just this underscores what I was just saying. Direct instruction in special ed are boosted significantly. There are others that are going up and down, and debt service is the big, you know, um, the big drop that is a bit of a windfall for us this year. Um, sure. Thanks. So, um, capital project summary. Now, these are just what the, these are the amounts that uh, stick from before the merger that stay with each school for their capital um, needs. And the uh, second to last one is, the, um, is what the school district as a whole has. That number will grow as the, um, the earmarked numbers for each school are drawn down for their various projects. And then it will just become a single district. Actually, um, that is, is that the money earmarked for our building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. In case we have needs. Yeah. I mean, the building's 10 years old now. So. Call that. I tried to fake <laughs> that's that. That's okay. You did. You did. <laughs> but, but in the future, you're right. I'm going to have to go with a way to track that. Scott did the same work. Okay. Um, Michael. Um, you know, just looking at this uh, bond uh, payoff, um, and this is more of a rhetorical question. How, how do you carry that, how do we carry that savings on forward and not Last be back. tempted to all of a sudden see this $460,000 hole to be Filled, um, and I'm not suggesting that that's what happens, but mm -hmm. a couple times, you, it, it, this is more than just a one-time benefit. This is mm -hmm. the paying off of the bond, yes. and that saving, saving that that lack of that expense goes forward forever. And 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 how how do we always kind of be aware of? that so we don't yeah. aren't tempted to I, say oh I hear you totally you, you know I mean how, 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 how does an organization and I've been on a number of boards but how, you know how, how, how do you keep that in mind as you're building the budget yeah it, it's hard it, only through rigorous disciplined capital planning and projecting ahead the um, the odds are stacked against us there are various incentives to um, you know you've explained to me, Deborah, incentives that, um, to, that encourage school districts to go to bond instead of paying as they go. Um, if you bond, that isn't counted on your, on your, your um, cap. Yeah. Um, but if you, that debt service, as you say, is a, is a chunk out of what you're able to spend from one year to the next for 20 years and squeezes, puts a squeeze on um, everything else that you, want to, that you want to do. So my own, and th there, there, there are different ways of doing this. There are different ways of, of approaching this problem. But I tend to be, um, I tend to be, I suppose, uh, a fiscal conservative in this regard, um, in trying very hard to uh, plan ahead and schedule the, um, the, ma the major capital expenses so that we can build up our reserves to meet them at the time that they occur. So to plan as much as we can. Obviously, things happen um, that, are, that you can't plan for. And you just have to try to be prepared to deal with but, but those. Not, thanks. But, but not so much that. It's just sort of like. Now, now we have four hundred sixty thousand seven hundred eighty-three dollars to to spend because we don't have to spend. That, that's how I don't want to look at it. Right. That's that's right. Why, yeah. yeah. Keep talking about the like the five percent drift. Five percent. Um, I, I I keep thinking of that five percent. Whoa. And then you know seven 
whatever it was, 7.8% was that for 1A. Mm -hmm. um, even more woe. Um, W-H-O-A, but maybe also W-O-E, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the board is focused more, more on that bottom line number, right? What's the effect on taxes? Mm -hmm. You know, what's that going to be rather than what's the pot of money we have to spend? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's the counterbalance is that exactly. at the end of every budget you get to a percentage. Exactly. And that's what you have to sort of grapple with. Right, I mean, I think you know I have been doing this long, but my, my experience with this has been that Nobody's seeing that four hundred and whatever thousand dollars as an opportunity, right, to go to our wish list, yeah. right, and, yeah. and and knock things off the wish list. Yeah. It's, it's just not working like that. Yeah. I'm not suggesting anyone is, but but any organization seeing that would mm -hmm. would you know be tempted if they weren't prudent, yeah. and which I think we are, to look at that. You know. So, okay. Thanks. And then just to, to add to that, we are looking at our buildings, right? Because not everybody has been, take, you know, every every single building in our district has different needs. So, you know, saying that we right now have, you know, paid a bond and are off in in that area in, um, you know, there's 460. We we also know that in our buildings there's uh, there's capital needs that eventually are going to need to be to be addressed. But that doesn't mean that we're looking at so we don't have enough money as it is to take care of the buildings. So we're looking at them holistically so we can have a capital plan to not have to you know, spend too much money. But with an eye on what Scott said, that we won't be able to always do that without going to bond. Do we, what, what's our, do we have a capital budget item for this year that we're budgeting for? Yes. yes. And what is that? 636. 636. And is that in line with what what the adequacy for putting that away over time to take care of all the buildings? It doesn't appear to be enough for the capital plan that we've had okay. a preliminary review of. Is it what percentage also, of our, that capital plan need is the 636? Um, the, the capital plan hasn't been um, sorted by priority yet, so it's hard to say. I think we would actually have to do some more analysis of that capital plan and refine the numbers because they were really rough. Mm -hmm. but, but as far as the immediate priority, we plan to bring that back to the board for further discussion next week at the right. Lindsay's meeting. And the Finance Committee will delve into it tomorrow as well. Uh, so I think there's two stages. The board mm -hmm. had asked for a short-term mm -hmm. capital plan yeah. and a long-term capital plan. And what we've accomplished is the short-term plan. And we're working on prioritization of that. The long-term plan is going to, we'll have to agree as to what next steps we should take in order to accomplish that and what length of time, et cetera. We have had one proposal mm -hmm. that we'll be considering and the board will be discussing in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, Katie. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, because I don't understand all these budget things sometimes, so if you could explain to me, maybe in simple terms, why East Montpelier has over $900,000 in capital funds, but they have a big bond that we're all paying for. So is that what this money is? Or how does that all work? No. Um, that's the money that they set aside in their reserve to take care of their own building. Even though they have a $2 million bond? So in prior years. So this is yeah. We've been putting it away for a year so that you wouldn't, we wouldn't have to, again, oh, yeah. you know, again, so taking care of the building. Is that a fair answer? So it wouldn't happen again, Lindy? Kind yeah. Of? yeah, that's yeah. a very fair answer. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay. been over many years. Yeah, okay. Because there wasn't that right. to keep the building up. Yeah. So rather than paying the bond, it makes more sense to be planning for the future and just pay the bond that you have. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I, I mean, I get that, but then you also owe it. But bonds aren't like a mortgage where you can prepay. Okay. Bonds are set up so that you have to pay them for the schedule, and that's why you get the favorable rates. Okay. Unlike a home where you can refinance when rates go down, um, the bond would not be able to be prepaid. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think what might be helpful too is like U32 um, has put away, um, we were both paying for a bond. 
and that's where the savings come from. But we were also um, budgeting four hundred, about four hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollars a year for capital, mm -hmm. and we saved extra monies over a course of several years to be able to do the track project without going to a bond. Yeah. And so now you see our numbers are back down lower. But <coughs> at one point in time last year, we had a pretty sizable capital fund. Um, but we had saved over time to be able to do those projects and now we're back into the save mode for the next big project which parking lot is probably but you know those kinds of things right. um, and so yeah it's just it kind of fluctuates a little bit back and forth as to where you are in the savings process and the, the big bond 20 years ago that hurt I mean we we all felt it to do u32 created this facility that has stayed state-of-the-art in a way and yep. beautiful and people come here and before the air quality was terrible and it was not a pleasant building necessarily to teach in after all those years of thinking the open school concept when it was built was a great idea and everybody built their own little walls that the renovation 20 years later and I I would like to think that's how East Montpelier will be as well mm -hmm. is it had gotten to a point of very cold very drafty very noisy heaters and not great air quality and now it's a beautiful building that you want to be in and i feel that way about u32 20 years after the renovations that it's still a beautiful building that when other people are here they're pretty impressed with and just as we are stewards of our financial resources on behalf of the community we have to also be concerned about the quality of the educational environment which our students enroll in school uh, it makes a very big difference if students are sitting in a room like this which is bright and clean and has a lot of natural light and their ability to engage in instruction and really uh, develop their skills as a compared to a school that it may have as you just described uh, poor ventilation or uh, obvious maintenance needs um, it's it's a change in how they how they believe that the community feels about their education to be honest mm -hmm. so uh, i think we have to be uh, very uh, thoughtful about how future planning for capital budget development is made, but in cases where we have been, such as U32, uh, this building has been maintained well due to the very uh, ex extensive amount of care and thought that has gone into their capital plan over time. That's what we're, our goal is for the entire district. Thank you very much. Jaya? I, just, I also think that there may be some minimal savings from doing these capital improvements to some of the buildings, like in other line items of the budget, like with fuel use or mm -hmm. um, yeah. correct. Oh, energy. Right. Right. Yeah. So one of the projects that was approved last year by the Worcester community, uh, the former school board, was a, an envelope uh, renovation for Jody's to Jody Memorial School, and that included uh, siding and insulation and windows. So, with the funds that they have in their project, they will be doing that next summer, and we know that there will be changes. There will be savings in fuel and electricity as a result. So, very good point. Thank you very much. Now we've hit my who? Yes, of course. I was just following up on something you said about the bond and the incentives on bonding. Um, I, I just unclear about what you're saying the benefit was because I, I think when um, East Montpelier was struggling with uh, the taxes and the, our budget that there was a sense from our board, and Linda you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that in fact we were being penalized as that the payment for the bond was you know considered to be education expenses and we were spending all this money based on the number of pupils, and we had made arguments, at least our board did, that that was not fair or proper, and the legislature you know, didn't do anything about it. That, so, so that spending that kind of money was considered, it came under the educational spending or, or the, the yeah. per pupil spending. So, right. so, so how, I'm just not sure, Scott, what you were saying about how. It does <coughs> come under. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me turn it over to the actual. He's just dying to turn it over. <laughs> yeah, so you're right. So when um, East Montpelier bond went through, the state disallowed 19% of the bond payment from a formula that we run to calculate whether our spending um, is above a penalty amount. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, statewide though, no one else has ever, that I've seen or heard of, have had that same thing and they have made changes at the Agency of Education. So nowadays, when you go out for a building project bond, um, you're able to get the state approval ahead of the game. And when you do that, what happens is a bond payment is reduced in a formula um, that determines whether or not you have to pay two dollars for every tax dollar that mm -hmm. you need yeah, yeah. and so what i think you were referring to is <coughs> if we just put money in the regular budget it doesn't get deducted for that formula so if we put money in for a capital budget yeah. that doesn't get deducted in this formula the state law says only bond payments get deducted in this formula so they're in, like he said they're enticing us to borrow money um, to pay for capital projects based on the current legislation. Okay. okay. And you mentioned the excess spending, if you were to exceed the formula, and you would have a double tax penalty. Mm -hmm. So it is an important distinction between mm -hmm. borrowing versus utilizing yes. your local funds that you save. Or yeah. But our bond didn't have to do with the excess spending as right, much right, as right. No. The, that 18 or 19 percent right. really right. had to do with <coughs> A particular little incident at the state, and that person no longer works there, and we. <laughs> so, not, not because of us. No. no, just that through attrition or retirement. Okay. But there, it really <laughs> was. <laughs> yeah. It, it was not fairly done, and Floor and other people put a lot of work into appealing it and going to the agency and the secretary and didn't win, but no other school is paying that or having that 19% not count in their bond part. So your hard work meant that you saved every other district in the future from having to experience that. Right. right. Well, well, the thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank um, you. So Scott, one um, final yes. <laughs> So do we have a sense on what the arbitration decision may, just because of the impact on potential impact on budget that's the only reason i'm asking yes super lawyer i'm just listening to the fact that you said you have a date no 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 proposals yep. and incorporated the maximum expenditure oh, okay. um, into yeah. our budget. So uh, we anticipate a neutral effect okay, in, uh, mm -hmm. at Thank least you. for the coming year. They're True. Okay. Way ahead of the game. Yeah. Great. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. I thought he was talking about I know. I know. Supreme, Supreme Court. Court. Scott, Scott, when this goes home, home, people are going to look at it and say, Callus, it's the bottom of the list. East Montpelier, it's the top of the list. And we're already paying East Montpelier's taxes. I'm speaking now for my neighbors. How are you going to um, answer that? But that's well, not the top of the list. Yeah. Um, in terms of these are uh, in terms of the size of the um, yeah. the proposed budgets, capital yeah. funds, the, yeah. the residual capital funds. Um, it, it's really, really completely separate thing. Okay. Yeah. Those came from and, each and school, what, just to yeah. be clear. Right. They came from each school, and by law, they were right. supposed they to stay with school. each school. So that's how much money Berlin we were put saying, away. That's what how much money Palace right. put away. Yeah. How much so money you put And, and okay. what yeah. it also would do is uh, for capital projects that are funded through the reserve funds don't come out of the merged budget. It sounds like Say it's, that again? Yeah. So what what comes out of the capital that, that are now capital um, budgets reserved for each school, taking care of their capital needs, doesn't come out of this budget until those those funds are used up. Thank you. Okay. I, is that, I yeah. think that's the way it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they were funds that were for years, however were much there. that were school district had wanted to percentage and, and voted. into there and voted yeah. in. That was what was decided, and, and so they got to keep case, it. They expended a significant amount of money in the last three or four years on our roofing and on that's right. sewer projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where the funds have been depleted. Thank you. Yeah. So it's like Stephen was saying about the cycle of the capital fund. You build it up and then you do something and it goes down and then you build it up again for the next project. And watch so that for decades got, of college. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. But the next build up will be a district, uh, will be a district. school district right. wide right. Yeah. versus by school. Right. Yeah. 
So we have actually, once again, I have held my streak of never ending a meeting on time.